Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, this talk is actually my reserve talk, the one I had up my sleeve. And um, because of the C day, uh, there was a request for another talk. So this is now coming out. This talk is a little more academic in places, but uh, the goal is that we're going to review the uh, different Canary Islands now, and then we're going to go a little bit into the scientific debate on the origin of the Canary Islands. Now, if there is some small technicalities that you find difficult, I'm available this afternoon. Um, I'll be at the square at 3 o'clock. If you have any questions, please come by, and I'm more than happy to try to answer them. But um, I will try to summarize the science there, so if there is a small detail, I don't think we have to kind of pay too much attention. I'll try to summarize the important facts about this. And then I want to close the talk with a short summary of the important geological features of the Canary Islands, those for which the Canary Islands are most famed in the scientific world. So we're going to talk about the Canary Islands, as I said, and then we're going to go into the origin of the Canary Islands. And the various islands are grouped here, and we're going to go through them step by step. So let's start. Where are we? Well, we're here. We are off the northwest coast of Africa, and the Canary Islands started about 100, 150 kilometers off the northwest coast, going all the way to about 550 kilometers. There is seven main islands and a tiny island, which um, got the status of a full island only two or three years ago, but I will focus on the seven main islands, not the eighth little one, which is La Graciosa, which is a tiny little island off Lanzarote. And it has a small population, but of course, the government of the Canary Islands don't want them to feel left out, so it became this uh, eighth Canary Island just a few years ago. So the Canary Islands have been an important place for navigation for a long time, and they have been an important place for science. This is an old Dutch drawing showing Mount Tede, which was a landmark in the ocean, and it's been used by sailors for many centuries. And here is Mount Tede in reality, and here as well. This is a drawing of the 1798 eruption on Tenerife. And the question that has always plagued scientists is, where does this volcanism come from? Where does magma come from? And this is... Uh, a drawing by Athanasius Kircher, a German uh, monk, actually, who was very scientifically minded. And he drew this vision of the interior of the Earth. And he believed there was two major cycles. One was a water cycle, which is depicted here in light blue. And the other one was a magma cycle. And he has these swarms of fire coming up from the interior of the Earth. Well, we know a little more today, but as I'll show later, we don't know everything. And uh, Kircher was certainly on the right track to helping us understand what could be going on inside the Earth. So the Canary Islands, as I said, they go from the eastern islands of Lanzarote and Fuerteventura towards the western islands of La Palma and El Hierro with the main and largest islands in between. That would be Gran Canaria and Tenerife. And then there is this little rather odd island, La Gomera, which unfortunately we couldn't visit. Now, I should point out that um, these islands are not a former land mass or anything like that. There is no evidence for that. But they sit on oceanic crust. And there is a magnetic anomaly here, which has been dated. It's the S1 anomaly. And it's 175 million years old. And there's another anomaly out there. And uh, this is a little younger. So the islands cut across these ocean floor anomalies. So they're somewhat at odds with a regular oceanic basement, which is also volcanic in origin, but it's a lot older. So we have this question that's been poking around for actually many tens of years. How do the Canary Islands fit into the overall geodynamic scheme of things? And here we can see that there's big channels in between the islands. Here's Tenerife, here's Gran Canaria, here's La Gomera. And there's no connection that we can see that maybe there's a land bridge that's just subsided a little. 
No such thing. The islands are independent edifices that stand alone. So I quickly gonna review the different islands now. This is an island that was not on our uh, list of islands to visit. This is Fuerteventura. It's in the very east of the archipelago. It's a rather flat island. It's got a highest elevation point at 807 meters. It's got a population of about 115,000 people, counted in 2019. And it's got a population density of about 70 uh, people per square kilometer. <coughs> I should point out, to give you a flavor here, the UK has a population density of about 240 people per square kilometer. Sweden, where I live, has a population density of 22 people per square kilometer. So there are certainly more people than in Sweden per square kilometer, but far less than, for example, in the UK or France or Germany. So it's flat and that means that the winds pass over quite easily and uh, this has good and bad sides. The good side is that uh, it makes beautiful beaches but the bad side is it's quite windy and sandy. And what we see here is a map of Northern Africa. That's a NASA map. So you see the Canary Islands here. Here's Lanzarote and Fuerteventura. Here's Gran Canaria. And we had this just the other day, these hot African winds coming over. And they bring dust from the Sahara. And this is a satellite image showing a big dust plume going all the way into the Atlantic Ocean. And in fact, these uh, dust storms, they reach Central uh, America and the southern part of the US. And um, here we see these uh, deposits of dust, partly local coral dust, but also a large fraction of dust from the Sahara. And as I said, it makes for a rather dusty area, particularly when the wind blows, but beautiful beaches when the wind is not blowing and the sun is shining. So uh, many parts are a bit like a desert on Fuerteventura and actually Lanzarote for that sake. And uh, there is also a lot of African influence. So the architecture is a little more African. That's at least my impression. And uh, the area is very dry, partly because the winds are passing over the island quite efficiently, therefore drying out the limestone. So Lanzarote, we've visited. Um, the highest elevation is 670 meters, also relatively flat. Population about 150,000 people. Population density is higher, 180, 180 people per square kilometer. And um, Lanzarote is uh, also rather dry, but it experienced a big eruption in 1730-36. And uh, this is the Timanfaya National Park. Here you see some of these lavas from the Timanfaya eruption, as it's widely known. And this led to a new way of growing crops on the island, and some of you will have seen it. This is the valley of Lageria, and there, uh, we'll talk in a minute a little more, there a new way of growing grapes, for example, has been developed, which allows Lanzarote to sustain a larger population. So here's a few impressions. The uh, area is uh, marked by dry landscapes, a few hills of older volcanic rock, and here there's a volcanic crater on the west coast that's used as a salina to make salt. Ocean water is allowed to let in and uh, into this coastal volcanic crater, and then the water will evaporate with time, and there's various basins that can then be flooded or uh, left alone to dry, and this was a major salt production for all of Europe in the past. These days, it's not quite the main way of making salt again. Uh, mining salt in the mountains is easier these days. So, but uh, making uh, wine and growing all sorts of other crops, dates, and uh, other fruit, um, this is very, very important for the economy of Lanzarote. And what happens here is that <coughs> in the 1730 to 36 eruption, it was realized that a little bit of volcanic ash on the soil is very, very good for growing plants. And once this has been understood, uh, people have been spreading volcanic ash over large areas of the island. Now, the wind is passing over the island. We said that, and the wind is drying out things. 
So people are building these little walls to protect plants. And here where we have a plant, and this is just about reaching through to the topsoil, and it's sitting within an environment of volcanic lapilli. The trick of the lapilli is they store a lot of moisture from the dew, for instance. So this is uh, very good for the plants because uh, they will actually have a lot more moisture available as if they would st just sit in topsoil. So the Kimanfaya National Park is very famous. It's this really eerie, barren landscape that uh, marks the central area of the Kimanfaya National Park. And, oops, and here we have these kind of volcanic deserts, lava fields, and um, this is one of the important national parks in the Canary Islands. It's the second most important after the Taylor National Park on Tenerife. Gran Canaria. Uh, Gran Canaria is uh, a little taller. It's almost 2,000 meters in altitude. Population is 850,000. That's a big island. And uh, the population density is very, very high, 545. So this is double the amount of people per square kilometer than for example, in the UK or France or Germany. So, and it's famous for its shape. It's a bit like an apple with a bite in it. So this is the bite in the apple, and I'll come back to that later on, and there's a little stem here. And um, it has a southerly area here with a big lighthouse, a faro. So uh, this is very important for navigation purposes. And uh, it's marked by an older volcanic area and a younger volcanic area. So there's a clear geological divide here, and the green areas, that's the younger volcanics, and the pink and blue areas are the older volcanics. And if you look at this timeline here, this is age in million years, <laughs> then up to about eight million years, these older volcanics formed, and then there was a gap of several million years, and then a new cycle of activity started, which affects mainly the northeast of the island where these green areas are, including the little, um, well, the little knob up there. It's called La Isleta. It was a formerly independent island, but it's now connected via, in fact, the city of Las Palmas. So we have this old area here in the south and southwest and a young area here, and therefore we have two fundamentally different types of landscape on Gran Canaria. So in the south, the deeply eroded valleys, they partly look like in the Grand Canyon, but they are entirely volcanic. The rocks are entirely volcanic in origin. And in the north, we have little volcanoes like this one near Galdar in the northwest of the island. And Las Palmas is uh, a very old and very beautiful city, if you ask me. And um, it is built almost entirely of rocks from the area. So this is the jewel in the crown of the island, I think. Gran Canaria is famous for this monolith, the Rocca Nublo monolith. It's been a holy place, a sacred place for the Aboriginal people. And um, it's a weathering relict, a former plug that uh, stands proud. And it's 80 meters tall. People love to hike up there. And um, it's at about 1,800 meters above sea level. So it's towering over the island. It's visible from many points on the island, and uh, people are loving to go there. In that area, there's also many caves that were used by the Aboriginal population, and this is a former hill fortress, Bentaiga. Actually there, the uh, Aboriginal people won a big battle against the Spaniards. The Spaniards tried to conquer this, but the uh, access was denied by uh, um, the strategic action of the Aboriginal people. Ultimately, of course, um, they couldn't defend the island, but there were some temporary successes for them on the way. So uh, in the northeast, we have this rather famous place, the Banda Mar Caldera. There's a big hole in the ground, a volcanic crater, and a little volcano right next to it. It's also famous for the wine that's grown there. There is a brand of wine called Caldera, and um, this is uh, produced in the lush northeast of the island. Here's the wine bottles, in case you're interested. So uh, I mentioned it, uh, Gran Canaria has a lot of um, archaeological sites. 
and there was a large population, an Aboriginal population, it's quite worthwhile. And they made big use. They had probably the most sophisticated society of all the islands in terms of the Aboriginal development. So Tenerife, um, it's the largest of the islands, highest elevation. It's got the highest peak in Spain, 3,718 meters. And population is even higher, 917,000. Uh, and the population density is, however, a whiff lower than uh, the one on Gran Canaria. It's marked by this triple arrangement. And this is the flag of uh, Tenerife. I always confused it with the Scottish flag. It looks awfully similar, doesn't it? And um, it's got a big volcano sitting in the middle here, and it sits inside the Las Cañadas caldera. Here's a satellite image. And uh, this is uh, something we'll come back to later. This is actually the margin of a giant landslide that happened 200,000 years ago. And Teide volcano is growing inside this landslide scar. But we'll talk a little more about this later. So Teide National Park is the most visited national park in Spain and one of the key national parks globally. It's hosting something like four million visitors per year. And uh, Teide is the jewel in the crown. It's the highlight. So here's the lavas negras, the dark lavas that came down. This was the last major eruption of Teide, and it happened about a thousand years ago. There was eruptions on Tenerife afterwards, but they didn't come from Teide itself. So uh, this is the most photographed rock on the island of Tenerife, I'm told. This is the tree of rocks, and it's an erosional remnant inside the caldera. And uh, you see the layers here. Well, it's very thin at its bottom. It'll fall over one day, no doubt. And a similar rock like this fell over on Gran Canaria. It was called the finger of God. It was very painful for the local inhabitants to accept that the finger of God had fallen, and there were big efforts. They were trying to think about a plan to put it back together and stick it up again and put some glue in there. Of course, the geologist said this is a useless exercise, and it was abandoned in the end. So I suspect when this one falls over, there will be a similar discussion, but uh, I personally think it's just the way things go. Time will take it down. So here's the Las Cañadas caldera, and uh, this is viewed from Teide Volcano. Here's the caldera margin. Here's younger lavas filling the caldera basin, and Gran Canaria is just over there in the haze. Nowadays, you don't have to climb up there. You can take a cable car up to 3,500 meters. And um, I've been talking to the person who operates the cable car. They're now thinking about putting a Michelin star restaurant on top of there as well. So you can dine in style and have beautiful views in the future, I hope. So Tate Summit, this is the part that's uh, locked off. This is the final tip up there. You need special permits. This is uh, going to be above the restaurant then. And there you can uh, find sulfur and uh, degassing of the vent if you like. But as I said, you need to get a special permit from the government to go there. La Gomera, the place we couldn't go. Um, the area is uh, rather small. Highest elevation is less than Tenerife and Gran Canaria with about 1,500 meters. Population is only about 20,000. And population density is comparatively low as well. La Gomera didn't have any volcanic activity in uh, uh, the last four million years, and certainly not in uh, historical times. But it's got beautiful valleys, because if volcanoes don't erupt, erosion sets in, and it's taking down the valleys. And um, it's taking down the landscape, making these valleys like here. And um, there is something in La Gomera that um, the locals are very proud of, and that's these roques, these domes or spines of slightly lighter colored rock that stick out. And um, here's a map, and I don't want to go into the details, but all these red areas on this map, these are dotted around in a uh, almost concentric fashion. These are the roques, these are these uh, spines that stand proud, and many of them had religious meaning for the Aboriginal people. So, and um, here's several ideas visualizing how they could form. These are plucks of volcanic material. They are pushed up into the surrounding rock, and eventually the surrounding rock is removed. And then we have these 
areas that stand proud and uh, they're visible in the landscape, even here being shown in the color of arms of the local municipality where this one, Roque Agando, is actually hosted. So El Hierro, it's one of the smaller islands as well. Only 10,000 people live there, and I, I actually learned recently that it's now even below 10,000. This is the number from 2019. And um, it's got a population density of only 40 people per square kilometer. It's marked by this triaxial uh, shape. Some people call it a Mercedes star. And um, this is very important because we have these large landslide stars in between these axes, and I'll come back to that later. And it's also famous because of this uh, hydro energy power plant that actually is able to sustain the energy demands of the entire island. It's a self-sufficient system, so um, rather pioneering in that respect. It's also famed for the holy tree, the Garaoi. This was an interesting story. Um, the Spanish conquerors pushed the Aboriginal people up into the mountains, hoping they will uh, die of uh, thirst up there because it's very dry in the mountains. But they had a little trick up their sleeve, the Aboriginal people, and that was this holy tree. And the tree is still visible today. It's actually catching the clouds and the water condenses and drips down, and they were collecting the drops from this tree, and that was enough to sustain some of the Aboriginal people, even without any contact to the coast. So La Palma, this is uh, the island of fire, if you ask me, because it hosts uh, a lot of active volcanic systems. It had most of the historical eruptions. Area is about um, 700,000 square kilometers. Highest elevation is 2,400 meters. Population is about 80,000. Population density is about 116. And you've probably seen it in the news. It hosted a big eruption just last year. So uh, there is two main parts of the island. There's the old part in the north, the Tabariente volcano, and this one collapsed in a large landslide about 550,000 years ago. And after that, all the activity shifted towards this ridge here, the Cumbri Vieja Ridge. And here is a map showing the submarine extension of it. So it doesn't just stop there at the southern end. It continues submarine. And this is where all the volcanic cones are aligned and they continue below the water towards the south. So here's a few impressions. This is the old landslide scar. A new little volcano has grown in there. It's called Pejenado Volcano. And further to the south, we have all these young eruptions. And this is the 1949 one, 1971, and this is the 2021 eruption. So, well, yeah, just a few impressions. The uh, La Palma eruptions was uh, scientifically extremely interesting, but it was rather devastating for the local population, causing a lot of problems in terms of loss of property and loss of plantation lands and things like that. So the islands that are gr to the west, the smaller islands like the La Palma Island and El Hierro, they are at the furthest out into the Atlantic, and there we have the bigger islands posing the question, how does it all fit together? How does it work? Why do we have flat islands in the east and mountainous but small islands in the west and these big islands in the middle? And this has posed a lot of questions over the past. So what we see here is we have these flat islands, Fuerteventura and Lanzarote, Gran Canaria is a bit taller, Teide is really the tallest of them all. Then we have La Gomera, and then we have La Palma with many volcanic eruptions over the historical period. And then we have El Hierro, which also had a volcanic eruption in 2011. So scientists hypothesize that the uh, islands are born at this end of the archipelago. Then they grow, and these are the old islands that are partly dismantled. How does this work? How does this fit together? Well, there's a big debate about this, and uh, here we have the archipelago again, and there's actually more volcanoes further to the northeast, but they're underwater. These are the ones here, and that makes a long chain of volcanoes going back 60 million years. 
So it's not just the islands we see that par are part of this. There is a set of seamounts, submerged volcanoes, that also are part of this chain, therefore giving us the feeling that the older islands get smaller and smaller. They're taken down because of no activity, while the young islands over here have a lot of volcanic activity. So something is different between the old and the young islands, therefore. Now, this has led to speculations that uh, maybe we have something like a Bunsen burner in the Earth mantle that produces the islands, and we know the African plate is moving at a certain rate, so it left this speculation out there that, like Hawaii, we have a stationary hot spot, as it's called, and the plate is moving over it. And the young islands happen where the hot spot is active, and once the island moves away from the active hotspot, the island will decay. And uh, we've done some work there a few years ago, and uh, we looked at the sediments, and indeed it seems that the older islands sit on older sediments. These are the sedimentary rocks coming from Africa, and the youngest islands sit indeed on the youngest sediments. So it is true there is an age progression, not just an erosional pattern, also, the younger islands have not started to grow at the same time as the old ones. They really have started to grow a lot later. This is important evidence. So then, if we look at the oldest exposed rocks on the island, we find that the oldest rocks on Fuerteventura are 20 million years old. The oldest rocks on El Hierro are only 1.1 million years old. So it really looks quite true that uh, the islands forming here in the west of the archipelago, and once they move away from this area where most of the volcanic activity occurs, they start to decay. And this rotation or this movement of the African plate can be seen here in this sequence of islands and seamounts. And in fact, it's also seen in the Madeira archipelago. So scientists have projected this to what we know as an Euler pole, a common rotation pole, and indeed the uh, plate moves, the African plate moves with about two centimeters a year. It's very slow, it's about the speed with which your fingernail grows. But over millions of years, it makes a huge difference. And therefore, we are pretty convinced that we have a hotspot area, a melting anomaly here and here, and the plate, the African plate, is gradually moving over this. So here is the idea. We have the melting anomaly in this part of the archipelago, and once the islands are moved with the plate, they will start to decay. Tenerife has grown to its fullest extent, and the prediction, if this model is correct, is that, well, Tenerife will start to go smaller now it's reached its highest elevation, and there will be probably not a lot more happening in the geological future. Now, here's a little consideration. Some people then said, ah, but wait, the Canary Islands, they sit here. There is a big fracture zone in the Atlas Mountains. Could it not just be a fracture zone extension? And this whole thing with a hotspot is all a bit um, out there. It's not quite real. Well, first of all, we know that the Azores sit on oceanic fractures. And note, the Azores here, they are all very elongate. All the islands are quite stretched out along the fractures. And all the eruptions are randomly distributed. This is different to the Canary Islands here. We have uh, the eruptions mainly focused in the western part of the archipelago, Lanzarote being an exception, but most of the eruptions are here and the islands are not quite as elongate. Here it's rather round, in fact. And also when you think of earthquakes, there's a lot of earthquakes along fracture zones like this oceanic fracture zone and in the Azores. These little dots here are earthquakes and the density of the dots means the number of earthquakes is higher if there is a high density. There is very few of those in the Canary Islands. So this is not a fracture zone that's giving rise to the Canary Islands. Now, I got a question the other day from one of the uh, passengers. How deep are these volcanoes sourced? And um, 
Well, my answer was that these volcanoes come from deep within the Earth, from 2,000 kilometers depth. And here is some of these uh, models. These are based on seismic data. And I'll explain the details later if you're interested. But what the method does is it depicts anomalies in the Earth's mantle. And if we look here, here's the Canary Islands. Here's the Cape Verde Islands. And you see this reddish anomaly going all the way down to the Earth core. And that is also here below the Canaries. So there is indeed a stationary anomaly of hot material that's rising up and feeding these islands rather than just a surface crack or anything like that. And that would be consistent with this concept of the plate moving gradually above this heat anomaly. So it looks rather convincing that, uh, like Hawaii, the Canary Islands are actually hot spot fed. So let's see whether I can make this work. The idea is therefore that they work a little bit like this. We have the plate moving from left to right here. The first island forms, but it moves away from the heat zone and starts to erode. Next island forms, next island forms. And over geological time, they will decay. And the younger islands that are not fully formed yet are La Palma and El Hierro, while Tenerife has seen its maximum extent and is now in for an unpleasant awakening because it will be eroded if this model is correct. So this is how we picture the islands to have formed. And this is a good explanation for the earthquake swarms that are absent largely for the uh, erosional pattern, for the age distribution of the rocks, and a few more of those features. So the big question in science was, is there a fracture continuation, or are we dealing with a mantle plume or a hotspot? And I think this one is truly correct because the age progression is very convincing and the fracture zone has a lot of earthquakes here, but very few here. It's not very convincing scientifically. So how does this work on a big global scale? Well, I remind you of Athanasius Kircher's map or view of the interior of the Earth. And uh, well, today the picture is like this. Actually, not so different, to be honest. Uh, we've come a little bit further, but not too much. So here is uh, the core, and this is the mantle. And there we have these heat anomalies of material rising up. And let me turn that for you. This is where the canaries would be. So I've just flipped it around now. So here we have Africa. And here we have, for example, Tede and Tenerife forming with these anomalies that rise up from the interior of the Earth, as we see here. So Athanasius Kirchner basically got the concept already several hundred years ago. And uh, it is not flames that rise up, however. It is hot rock. And close to the surface, this hot rock will make magma. So I want to spend the last few minutes. We have, I think, 10 or so minutes left. I want to spend the last few minutes on the important geological features of the Canary Islands, those the Canary Islands are famed for. This includes rift zones and giant landslides, lava tunnels, and I will give you a quick summary of the recent historical eruptions in the archipelago. So rift zones, well, the Canary Islands have what we know as rift zones, or the Spanish call it dorsales, uh, these long ridges, and uh, they're tens of kilometers long, and they are actually the ones that host the volcanic eruptions. So here on Tenerife, we have the northeast rift zone, and Tate sits in the center, the northwest rift zone, and these are the historical eruptions, and they occur along these rift zones, not so much from Tate itself. So these rift zones are seen also on El Hierro, also on La Palma, and this is Hawaii. And Hawaii has rift zones too, but they're not as well defined as in the Canary Islands. And this is actually why UNESCO has given UNESCO World Heritage um, a status to Tate, because you can see this phenomenon of the rift zones a lot better than, for example, on Hawaii. So here's one of the rift zones, the northeast rift zone, uh, viewed from Tate Volcano. It's this area here. And it hosted the 1705 and 1704 eruptions. And um, here we see the rift zone now from 
this other end looking from the Anaga Peninsula to what Stata, Stata is here, and this is a very narrow long ridge for tens of kilometers. And uh, La Palma has a rift zone as well. This is the Cumbre Vieja, and I mentioned it before, it extends submarine, and it's the area where most of the volcanic eruptions occur. And we have this large landslide scar, the Caldera de Taburiente, and uh, this sits up here. And the new volcano, the volcanic ridge, is growing from it. So the intriguing thing is that people realized early on there's a link between the rift zones and the landslides. And whenever we have rift zones, we likely have landslides. Wherever we have these landslides, we seem to have rift zones. So this is the big crack, the famous crack that opened up in 1949 during the eruption and which gave rise to the speculation that this area of La Palma might break off into the sea. And this connection between rift zone and landslide is partly used for this argument. The idea is that if you have magma pushing into the rift zone, it will widen the rift and push out the slag. So there is a sensible reason for thinking that rift zones might actually be the reason for the landslides. So what are these giant landslides? They are enormous collapses and um, there's volumes of thousands of cubic kilometer with run out distances of hundreds of kilometers. And we have them recorded on virtually all the islands. This is a reality, it's not a fiction. So there is evidence for Lanzarote having had some and Puerto Ventura, Gran Canaria, and of course Tenerife and the Young Islands where it's most obvious because we have the best record because they are not so deeply eroded. There we see a whole series of large landslides coming from in between rift zones. So this is something we need to be aware of. But this led to a lot of speculation some 15, 20 years ago and uh, a lot of people got really worried that La Palma will collapse and make a huge tsunami when it does so and the tsunami might travel all the way to North America and destroy the eastern seaboard. Well, good news, nothing happened in 2021 during the eruption. So La Palma is pretty stable. These events do occur, but they're very rare on human timescales. There's no indication that any of the Canary Islands is unstable right now. But if you were to ask me, uh, can it happen? Then I would have to say, yes, it can but the probability is incredibly low. So this is a numerical model done by some of the researchers that are uh, in favor of this tsunami idea, and the argument here is that if La Palma would collapse, that's the worst case scenario, if it would collapse, it would create this wave, and this wave would travel out from La Palma, and after five minutes, it would have spread so far, after 30 minutes, it would have spread to the other islands here, and after about nine hours, it would reach Florida. So it's not inconceivable. It's a possibility, but a very remote one, I must stress. So rift zones and landslides, there is a clear connection between the rift zones and the landslides, and these landslides do occur. But I stress, geologically, it's very rare. Here is the island of El Hierro, and here we have a big landslide scar, the El Golfo landslide scar, and this is very young. And uh, there we have a lot of fertile ground in there, so strangely enough, like on Tenerife with the Orotava Valley, these collapse valleys are actually very good for agriculture. They are wind sheltered, and uh, they produce a lot of wine, grapes, and other things. So here's just another impression of El Golfo. It's actually the largest cliff in Europe with about 1,400 meters. And here's some of the older ones. This is the El Jolan embayment, which was a landslide in the past. And here's the Las Playas embayment, and uh, some of the people may have seen it on a trip to El Hierro, at least on the bus trip I was. We had a quick visit, but it was largely covered in clouds, unfortunately. So here is a fracture in the rear of the landslide. This is in this area here. And there is me trying to climb up the fracture. I didn't get much further than this, by the way. But um, here we see the fault line of this giant landslide. Tata itself is also sitting, oops, 
Haiti itself is also sitting in this landslide scar of the Ecot landslide, which is the Las Canadas caldera, and uh, here's the Tate edifice that has grown in there. But there was likely several uh, landslides here. You see that it's a little bit curved, so it's not entirely clear whether it was just one or whether there were some other processes playing a role as well. Gran Canaria, the bite in the apple, I said I'll come back to that. It's a landslide. It's a giant landslide here. You see the embayment viewed from this area here, and this means that these islands do become unstable once they grow too fast, and then they can partly break off and have material shed into the sea. And on Fuerteventura, here, the southern peninsula uh, had an embayment as well, and indeed, it's also a landslide. So geologically, this is a real process. Now, a few words about lava caves. Don't want to spend too much time on this, but the Canaries are famous for their caves. People have been hiding in there to make sure the pirates wouldn't catch them in the past, and uh, you can visit many of these caves. Here's a few from the various places. Uh, Lanzarote is quite famous for them, La Palma and Tenerife. And uh, here's a few impressions from Hawaii. There you can see how these caves form. There's liquid lava traveling underground, and you have a solid crust above. I don't think this is very safe, if you ask me, but uh, here we go. And uh, once the tubes are drained out, you and everything has cooled down, you can actually walk inside. So here's a little sketch of how this might form. The lava flow will form a crust, and once the crust has hardened, the interior is still liquid and will continue flowing and can, in fact, drain out, and then you are left with a lava tube. So sometimes the lava tubes have little sky holes. They have little holes on top where the crust may break in or founder, and then you get what's known as hornitos, rootless vents or little ovens, as they're sometimes called, and this is where magma might spill out from the underlying lava tube as long as magma is in transport. Now, this is my friend Juan Carlos and myself visiting one of the caves in uh, Tenerife, and, well, for most of the time it was rather dark and I didn't see it, praise the Lord, but once they put the lights on, we saw that the whole cave was full of these spiders. And uh, it was rather, I don't know, I'm not a big friend of spiders. So, and uh, I learned that outside the caves, these spiders are beautifully colored inside. They have lost their pigment because they don't need it. It's usually dark in there. Ooh. So um, I was glad they switched off the light again <laughs> after a while. At least I couldn't see the problem. So, but um, a few words about Cesar Manrique. Uh, he was an artist on Lanzarote and he used caves and he built modern architecture into these caves. So here, for example, there is uh, one of the big caves with uh, little kind of lakes in there and special species living in there. But uh, Cesar Manrique, he built a restaurant into one of these caves and a concert uh, uh, um, hall into another cave. And uh, here on La Palma during the 2021 eruption, we actually see some of them forming. Here you see liquid lava, here you see liquid lava, and then the liquid lava disappears. There is a lava tunnel underneath that feeds these kind of uh, areas down here. And once this is completely cooled, there will be new lava caves on Tenerife as well. So the last bit, and uh, I'm almost on the hour. Sorry for running a little bit over, but um, it was supposed to be a full hour's talk. For those of you who need to go, I understand, but I'm going to spend another five minutes only on the historical eruptions now. And uh, there is historical eruptions reported from, of course, La Palma, Tenerife, and Lanzarote. And there was a submarine eruption off El Hierro. The other islands had no historical eruption. And uh, this is the 1971 eruption on La Palma, and this is the 2021 eruption. So here's a list, and um, this is available in various of the articles. I left some over there. Uh, feel free to take a copy if you're interested. And this is a list of all the historical eruptions, starting with the Columbus eruption described by Columbus himself when he was passing the archipelago. He saw an eruption in the mountains, and it turned out to be correct. 
all the way down to the latest eruption here in 2021. But I should stress, 50% of these historical eruptions occurred on La Palma, not on the other islands. So historical eruptions on Tenerife, 1492, 1704. Ah, very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm David on the French speaking air. Well, it's time to talk 12 noon, so time for a daily update on our position and our progress as we head north up towards Lisbon. Well, I hope you've been enjoying this uh, fine Swedish month, all the sun is cloudy here and there, and the wind has eased up a little from yesterday, so I got a moderate swell there, so it's not too uncomfortable for you. But we do have a stabilizer here working on our way and we tend to steer the wind from side to side. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, our position at lunchtime today at 12 noon, uh, latitude and longitude is 35 degrees and 32 minutes north and 11 degrees and 1 minute west. Geographically, that puts us at 140 miles southwest of the tip, southwest or tip of the Cordilleras uh, Capes of Winter, which means that we just have 200 16 miles left to run uh, towards the main coast cover, 424 miles west at the rock face. Uh, it's doing a sweet job right now, Knox, and uh, northeasterly wind there, so that's 20 knots, just like our sea towers up there. Air temperature, 16 degrees Celsius, which is 61 degrees Fahrenheit. So for our arrival tomorrow morning, we'll be in nice and early, just to keep you up. Uh, I'll finish up by about 6.30, and uh, take you with the sights of Gangly and uh, Pega Por Doors and Big Tiki and Door as well, and the quaint and scenty palace no less of uh, Stowe and Cliff uh, coming up for our uh, next cruise. So we line up uh, at the provision line up door, and uh, our luggage door as well that we line up, uh, and uh, our gangly position, and uh, our garb we got to wear as well. So there's quite a lot of choreography goes on on the arrival in, in the morning, and uh, uh, as we just line our lines and we've got to maybe move ahead um, to the uh, eight to ten centimetres of process. It's not very fine tuning um, in the morning for some people. It's very just parallel parking for that morning. And um, anyway, so we uh, head for the Regret Resort to take a sweet but early and start with a few hour pack for that sort of thing. We start when we uh, are at our first cruise and ancient, uh, well, uh, halfway up the river and stop at the pilot station about quarter to five. And then uh, passing under the bridge, pop around uh, the step down to five, past five, ten past five in the morning, and then uh, coach up towards the Sky Arch Club alongside six o'clock. And as I say, all the press come in and sit down for the evening at about six thirty or thereabouts. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, today uh, uh, it's been a good ride and a privilege of being here on this uh, wonderful Alan Night Canaries Island cruise. And, uh, 22,000 miles of long Atlantic harbour and uh, I just keep coming back to this uh, weather from the uh, bases and evening friends uh, of course I'm using uh, the evening calls this week I guess on behalf of uh, all my uh, team members on board uh, right through to Tom and Sam thank you very much uh, for uh, sailing with us here at Seaboard but especially with us here on the Seaboard Concourse we've been super thrilled uh, to have you uh, with us and of course we're delighted to be uh, uh, sailing on deck. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, the, uh, uh, I hope you have a wonderful lunch, uh, enjoy the afternoon, and uh, have a splendid evening with us here on board the Sea Ball Course. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you um, for staying with me the last few minutes. Um, yeah, I was talking about um, the historical eruptions in Tenerife, and uh, the oldest one was recorded by Columbus. The last one was uh, 1909, and uh, this was the one that Columbus saw from the ship while going back to Gomera at the time. And uh, they are relatively small, but one of them hit the harbor of Garachico. So this was uh, a bit of a disaster back then in 1706. It destroyed the harbor basin, unfortunately. So just a few impressions. This is the 1492 eruption, and this is the lava flows of the 1492. And uh, this is what Columbus saw from a distance. And there has been a radiocarbon date. People have found little charcoal pieces under the lava, a burnt tree, effectively. And you can get a radiocarbon date. And it fits with co the time of Columbus passing. So we are pretty confident that Columbus wasn't making it up. So uh, here's the 1492 viewed from 
the uh, center of the island. Here's the vents and the lavas. Just a very quick impression. Then 1705, this is the cone of uh, the 1704, 1705 uh, eruption, the Fasnia event, um, Fasnia and um, uh, several other events. And um, here, another view on the same thing, a rather isolated little area. Here's the observatory up there. So uh, this is in an uninhabited area, and it didn't really cause any damage. The other eruption was uh, uh, down here, 1705. It was almost a continuation of this event, just a few kilometers further. And you can see the little volcano here and the lava coming down here. It happened in the Guima Valley, and the lava ma made it almost all the way to the sea, but stopped just before the sea. There was a little bit of damage because people lived there, but it was uh, relatively small. 1706 was a bit of a disaster. As I said, here's the town of Garachico, and it had this beautiful port for trading with the Americas. And uh, here's an old oil painting, and uh, the lavas coming down were flowing into the harbor basin. Nobody died, but the harbor was left useless afterwards. This caused people to look for another area, another harbor that was more protected and out of the way of volcanoes, and that led to Santa Cruz becoming the capital instead of Garachico. So the 1798 eruption was in the center of the island. Again, nobody got hurt, and this is the vents of the 1798 eruption. So um, the 1909 eruption, there was... Uh, uh, some photographs available, and here's some photographs of it. It also happened in an uninhabited area. This is the Chingero eruption, 1909, and uh, nobody got injured. And people were flogging up there, a bit like uh, on Iceland last year. People were watching the volcano erupting, and it was rather harmless. So Timanfaya, this was the big eruption on uh, Lanzarote, and it lasted for six years. <coughs> And uh, many of the villages had to be evacuated. 20% of the island's surface were covered with volcanic products. This was also a bit of a disaster. So here all the colored areas on this map are actually covered with either lava or ash. And uh, this was a bit of a problem for the island. Many people were shipped off to the other islands at the time. And uh, nowadays, it is, however, a major tourist attraction, the Timanfaya National Park. It's this area here in western Lanzarote. And you're not allowed to walk freely there because uh, the idea is that we want to protect the landscape and we want to also leave nature to itself. And you can actually see the first forms of colonization, lichen growing on the lava, for instance. So this is how it looks, Timon Faya. This is some of the vents of the 1730-36 eruption. And here's a few more impressions. Here we have a beautiful hornito, one of these areas where a lava tube must be underneath. And um, Lanzarote is quite well known for this mineral, olivine. It comes up in these volcanic rocks, and uh, the local people use it to make jewelry from it. It's very popular with some people. It's not super valuable, if you ask me, but uh, it's got a beautiful kind of uh, slightly orangey-green touch, and people say it's got a very calming effect on you. So, uh, so those of you who have been in the National Park, you've seen these experiments. There is some hot air, some hot steam coming out of some of these holes in the ground, and if you put some straw in there, it ignites. And if you put water in there, you get a little geyser, a little artificial geyser. So, El Hierro, we're almost at the end. El Hierro had an eruption that was offshore here. The rift zone continues submarine as well. And uh, there was this submarine eruption 2011, 2012, about two kilometers offshore near the village of La Restinga. And this is how it looked. We had these plumes of dirty water coming up and we had these floating rocks, and the rocks had enough bubbles in them, and they were hot, and they were floating as long as they were hot. As soon as they cooled down and the water penetrated into the pore spaces, the rocks were sinking back down again. Nobody got injured, but a lot of fish died, unfortunately, and this was a fish reserve, this area, and uh, this was a bit unfortunate. 
So the last aspect here is La Palma with many historical eruptions, 1685 up to 2021. This is an image from 1677 showing that uh, there was devastation. There's little houses that got destroyed. So history repeats itself. Um, the current eruption was actually just here and uh, close to the 1949 lavas. So in a way, the people on La Palma knew they had it coming, if you will. And indeed, again, preparations were quite good. Nobody got injured, but property damage was, of course, quite enormous. So here's a few impressions. This is a photo from the 1949 eruption on La Palma, which was happening up here and sent lava all the way down to the coast on either side of the ridge, by the way. So uh, here we have uh, the area of the Cumbre Vieja with many of those um, eruptions. And I have just uh, added a little collage of images from 2021. 1917, 1677, 1949, this is 71, and this is 49 as well. So many eruptions on La Palma, and uh, here's just a few impressions from the last eruption, 2021. And um, luckily I got special permission, so I was able to go very close to the lava. It was exciting, I have to admit, albeit maybe a little dangerous at times. So. This is the volcano that has grown after 87 days. This is the same area on the first day of the eruption. This is at the end of the eruption. So this cone grew in about three months. Enormous growth rate with several meters a day. And of course, the area that got devastated here early in the eruption, here later, this is the same area. Well, a lot of damage to the infrastructure and the plantations there. So 2,800 buildings got destroyed, uh, 1,000 hectares of plantations uh, got covered, 70 kilometers of vital roads. But the good news is nobody got really seriously injured. And that's quite an achievement for a volcanic eruption of this magnitude. So thank you very much. If you're interested, many of those things are in our geology textbook. And it's uh, written with an excursion guide at the end. And you can get this on Amazon, uh, for instance. And uh, then all I have left to say is thank you very much for sticking with me and for your attention. Very much appreciated from my side.